Good morning and welcome. Glad you all could be here this morning. Just to uh, run through a couple of announcements real quick before we begin this morning. Um, we have uh, three people for church membership uh, coming up on December, uh, I think no, I said November the 29th, didn't I? November the 29th, last Sunday in November, that we'll be voting on. So all members, we ask that you would please stay and vote on. Uh, Jan Olet, uh, she has requested to be members, and then Rich and Carolyn Rounds as well have requested to be members as well. So if you have any questions or comments, uh, please come see me, and I'll be glad to answer those questions or comments about that. So again, it's Jan and then Rich and Carolyn. So we're looking forward to that on November the 29th. And so that's a good piece of good news this morning. We're glad that you are all here with us this morning on this bright day. It's getting chillier. Uh, winter is coming. And so we are glad that you're able to join us in the house of the Lord. We thank you, those who have uh, joined us by way of Facebook Live as well. We thank you for that. But let us go to the Lord in prayer as we start our services this morning. Heavenly Father, we want to recognize you as our great God, the eternal Lord, the Prince of Peace. Father, in a world that is full of chaos, a world that is seemingly more and more often sowing the seeds of discord amongst its citizenry, Father, we thank you that you are on the throne. We are thankful that even though what is going on may cause us to be discouraged and dismayed, Father, we, as your children, you are working all things for our good. Then in times like these, we often need to be reminded, not only on a daily basis, but sometimes on a moment-by-moment -moment basis, that you are in control, and that you know what's best. Not just for our sakes, but for your glory. And Father, as we go into the services this morning, may we rest in the fact that you are in control, that everything's being worked out as you have planned and as you have decreed. Father, there may have some walked in this morning that may have concerns, may have struggles. Father, we ask that you would allow us to be able to concentrate on you and you alone for the next few moments, for you so richly deserve it. Father, help us to be worshiping people this morning. Help us to be a loving people. Help us to exhort and encourage one another this morning through word, through song, and through prayer. And these things we ask in your son's name. Amen. Let us stand and sing our first hymn this morning, And Can It Be? And Can It Be?
Hear this, all ye people. Hear this, all you peoples. Do you mind playing through that one time for us? chapter number four, Micah chapter number four for our Bible reading this morning out of the Old Testament. If you will uh, stand out of respect of God's word, we will do this responsibly. I'll do verse one, you will do verse two, I'll do verse three, and so forth and so on. Micah chapter four, verses one through thirteen. If you do not have a Bible, the words will be on the screen as well. So let us stand and read out of God's word together this morning. Micah chapter four, beginning in verse number one. But in the last days it shall come to pass that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established in the top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and people shall flow unto it. And many nations shall come and say, Come, and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, and to the house of the God of Jacob. And he will teach us our ways, and we will walk in his paths. 
for the law shall go forth of Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And he shall judge among many people, and rebuke strong nations afar off, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up a sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. But they shall sit every man under his vine and under his fig tree, and none shall make them afraid. For the mouth of the Lord of hosts I shall be. For all people will walk every one in the name of his God, and we will walk in the name of the Lord our God forever and ever. In that day, saith the Lord, will I assemble her that halted, and I will gather her that is driven out, and her that I have afflicted. And I will make her that halteth a remnant, and her that was cast far off a strong nation. And the Lord shall reign over them in Mount Zion from henceforth, even forever. And now, O Tower of the Lord, the stronghold of the daughter of Zion, unto thee shall come, even the first dominion, the kingdom shall come to the daughter of Jerusalem. Now, why dost thou cry out aloud? Is there no king in thee? Is there counselor perished? For pangs have taken thee as a woman in travail. But he in pain, pain labor and reward, O daughter of Zion, like a woman in travail. For now shalt thou go forth out of the city, and thou shalt go out in the field, and thou shalt go even to Babylon. There shall not be delivered. There the Lord shall be from the hand of thine enemy. Now also many nations are gathered against thee, that say, Let her be defiled, and let our eye look upon Zion. But they know not the thoughts of the Lord, neither understand they his counsel, for he shall gather them as the sheaves into the poor. Arise and thresh, O daughter of Zion, for I will make thine horn iron, and I will make thy hooks brass, and thou shalt beat in pieces many people, and I will consecrate their gain unto the Lord, and their substance unto the Lord of the whole earth. May the Lord add a blessing to his word being read. Thank you, and you may be seated. And let us sing for our next hymn, There is a Fountain Filled with Blood. There is a Fountain Filled with Blood.
reading this morning. If you would take your Bibles for our New Testament reading this morning, for our New Testament reading in First Peter, I mean Second Peter chapter three. Second Peter chapter three. And again, if you don't have a Bible, the words will be on the screen. And we will stand again for the reading of God's word if you are able. Second Peter chapter three, verses one through eight. We will do this in unison, beginning in verse number one of Second Peter verse three. We will do this in unison. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets, and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished, but the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Thank you. May be seated. May the Lord add a blessing to his word being read this morning. You would, our last hymn before the message, O Sacred Head Now Wounded, O Sacred Head Now Wounded. Matthew chapter 20, 
Matthew chapter 20 this morning. The children may be dismissed to Children's Church. Matthew chapter 20 for those of you that are staying. We have dealt last Sunday evening with the parable of the landowner. And it was a basically a giant illustration of Matthew chapter 19, verse 30. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. Now Jesus uses this story to explain to his disciples the principle that in his kingdom the last are first and the first are last. And that means a lot of things to a lot of people, but we looked at Sunday night, and this is important for us to understand going forward into this morning's message, now that we should learn, or we learn one of the things is that we should experience in this life the fact that we are just hired by God to go about God's business. That we should think of us by doing X, Y, and Z that we're going to receive A, B, and C. Thinking that if we do something and we get a different result than what is expected, that somehow God has shortchanged us. And if we serve the kingdom, if we serve the Lord with that attitude, very often we're going to feel bitter, discouraged, and dismayed because we feel that maybe God has shortchanged us or God doesn't live up to his promises. As we learned in the parable of the landowner, our Lord is generous and gracious, and he promises to reward his children far more than we deserve. I think we need to work with that spirit in mind. But it also teaches us and reminds us that God's reward are not according to human and earthly measure. I mean, think about it. We asked the question Sunday night, and I hope we had answered that question. The question we asked Sunday night, is God fair? Is God fair? This is the same question that the people hired in the parable of the landowner essentially asked. And they agreed, the first people that were hired in the parable of the landowner... They agreed to a certain amount of day's wage. The landowner, knowing that he needed more help, went out to the third hour, the sixth hour, the ninth hour, and the eleventh hour, and hired people based on the promise that he would give them what is right. And so, when it came to pay, he paid the eleventh hour people first, then the ninth hour, then the sixth hour, then the third hour, and then he paid the people the entire who worked the entire day, and he paid them all the same amount. And the first people that were hired's initial reaction was what? That's not fair. How come they who only worked one hour gets to pay as much as I who worked the entire twelve hours? And we learn as we go forward that God is not fair. That God is just, but he's not fair. And so, as we move from the parable of the landowner into the passage this morning, verses 17 through 19, we see God's justice and his lack of unfairness. We're dealing, uh, broadly speaking, who is the greatest in the kingdom. And you see in verses 19, 19, verse 30, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. And then you, it's very interesting, you have the parable of the landowner, and then you have this section, verses 17 through 19, and then what are they arguing in verse number 20? I want to sit on your left hand and your right hand. I want to be the great in the kingdom. 
And so let us look at verses 17 through 19 this morning as a way of getting into the message this evening, verses 23 and on following. So verses 17 through 19, Matthew chapter 20, And Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples apart in the way and said unto them, Behold, we go up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death. And shall deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify him, and the third day he shall rise again. Let us go to the Lord in prayer before we get into the message I've entitled, The Last Shall Be First, The Last Shall Be First. Let us go to prayer. Father, we come before you this morning, and we thank you that your word is truth. And Father, we ask that you would use your spirit to open our hearts this morning. Allow the Spirit to illuminate the text. Allow us to see what you would want us to see this morning. And Father, we ask that you would draw us unto yourself this morning. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, as we said in the immediate context, the parable of the landowner is very important for us to understand these three verses and the verses that follow. The workers hired in the first hour said that the landowner wasn't fair. The landowner rebuffed the attitude and he said that it was that he did what was just. They agreed to a certain amount being paid and he paid them justly. It was not that he was not fair, it was that he was generous and gracious to the others. As one author says, the parable of the vineyard is no doubt about the abundance of God's grace. But crucial for the parable is that the owner told his manager to pay the last hired first. If he had begun paying those hired first, they would have not known that all were being paid at the same rate. God's grace, he goes on to say, is the grace of truth refusing to hide from us the character of our envy of those who we think undeserving. He goes on further to say, the parable of the vineyard exemplifies God's justice, a justice disciplined by the truth. God's overall graciousness in the parable of the landowner, because the landowner typifies for us that it is God the Father himself. Jesus makes it again very clear for the third time in Matthew, that he's going to the cross. For the third, third time, he's going to be condemned to die. He's going to be mocked. He's going to be flogged. He's going to be crucified by the Gentiles, only to be raised again on the third day. The guys who were hired the first hour said, that's not fair to the landowner. Do we think it's fair that the landowner himself is going to die in verses 17 through 19? God's justice requires payment for sin. And is it fair that God sends his son to die for your sins? Jesus has warned the disciples time and time again to not look at how man sees things, but how God sees things. Matthew has repeatedly shown us throughout the book that Jesus has repeatedly said to the disciples that the first will actually find themselves last. And yes, we see this marvelous illustration of verses 1 through 16 as an illustration of the first shall be last and last shall be first. But what a better example of this illustration than we see in verses 17 through 19 when Jesus goes to the cross. And so as he speaks to his disciples about his death this morning, he wants us to learn from him and the disciples to learn from him about his death and what true greatness is. You see there in verse 
17 this morning that Jesus tells the disciples the truth. I mean, what better example of God's grace that we find outside of verses 1 through 16, the parable of the landowner, that we find in verses 17 through 19. And while Jesus is facing the object of his crucifixion months, just months now down the road, the disciples on either end of the parable and this section are wondering who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom. They're still arguing over who's going to be great in the kingdom. And yet, with all of this going on, Jesus takes the time to take his disciples away from the crowds, away from everybody, and he takes the twelve away, kind of secluded, and he goes and he tells them in verse 17 that they're going to go to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man shall be betrayed. The, the amount of concern and love that Jesus has for his disciples. Jesus has already told them twice on two separate occasions that this is going to happen, and yet Jesus is continually reminding the disciples about what is about to happen to him. Jesus is showing that his impending death is coming. What we would consider his passion, his sufferings are coming. His resurrection is coming. He is going to be ill-treated, he tells the disciples, by the Jewish authorities. But these are the very people who are spiritually, supposed to be the spiritual leaders of the nation, are going to do him a disservice in the coming weeks and months. And as again, we have said that this is the third time, but this is the third time that he has put in such a picture of what is about to happen that the, Jew, that the disciples are awestruck about what's going to happen. And if you were to look back at Matthew 16, where he make, first makes the announcement, and Matthew 17, where he does, it does so again, and we're going to look at both of those passages in a few moments, you would see that he kind of is very vague about it in those two passages of scriptures. He each prediction, he gives them a little bit more information until this one where he gives them all of the information that is required. I mean, just think about how Jesus cares for these group of men. Just about everywhere that Jesus goes, there's huge crowds following him, wants to learn of him, wants to be healed by him. And Jesus is more often than not willing to do those things. But Jesus takes the time out of his busy schedule, about, out of the time about thinking about his own crucifixion. He brings the twelve apart and he tells them these things. I mean, this was... Hard for them to understand. This was hard for them to swallow that their master, that their rabbi, that their teacher was going to die in such a way. I mean, remember back to the first time. They were absolutely horrified. They were angry with him that he was going to die this way. The second time, they thought of it very selfishly. They said, no, you can't die this way because who's going to be great in your kingdom? Continually, Matthew is showing us that the disciples in all of first century Judaism thought the Messiah was going to be a king who reigned on the earth. But Jesus, and what we see in Scripture, is reminding us that Jesus first had to be a suffering servant before he could become a king. Jesus is revealing the truth to the disciples, showing a concern for their souls. He wants them to know what's about to happen. He wants them in a loving way to understand that these things are going to happen. And trust me, he loves them enough not to tell them that these things are going to happen because he knows that this is going to be devastating to them. I 
mean, you think about it. Jesus took the time, showed care and concern to tell his disciples the truth about what is going to happen. And in a little aside this morning, should that not be an example to us when we tell someone the truth that we should show the same love and concern to them? Because so often when we try to tell someone the truth, we mess it up because we tell them the truth, but we don't tell it in a loving way. Or we try to tell someone the truth, but we don't care for their souls. You can ask my wife. I'm probably one of the worst at it. We had an incident last night that this has come out. And I went to say something to one of my children. And in the heat of the moment, I was trying to help this one understand something. And I made it worse. And I thought I was being loving, and I thought I was trying to tell that one the truth, and I was trying to help this one. And I actually, in how I went about doing it, I actually made the whole situation worse. And we do that sometimes, not just with our children, but our siblings, our, our spouses sometimes. And we as Christians need to be careful how we present the truth. And we need to do it in a loving concern for each other. Just as Jesus here has lovingly cared for the disciples by taking them aside, wanting them to know the truth about what's going to happen in the coming weeks and months. And Jesus is focusing his disciples on that he is going to die. He's focusing, if you would look through verses 20 through 28 of this same chapter, chapter, that Jesus willingly chose this route. Jesus is saying, if you want to be great in my kingdom, you have to die yourself. Jesus says, I'm the first in the kingdom because I've made myself last. I'm going to the cross to die for you. I mean, think about it. Time and time again, as Jesus is saying that he's going to the cross, he's going to suffer and he's going to die, he's going to rise again the third day. In between those things, he's often told the disciples to take up your cross and follow me. What a horrifying picture for the disciples to think about is that they have to carry a cross. A symbol of pain, a symbol of humiliation, a symbol of criminal activity. And Jesus is telling the disciples to take up this cross and follow him. Jesus is saying, you've been talking about how you want to be great in the kingdom. You've been arguing about all of these things. And I'm telling you, through this parable and through what I'm about to show you by my example, is you have to die yourself. And self-denial, if you think about it, is a spiritual fruit of our obedience to the first commandment. What is the first commandment? You shall have no other gods before me, right? Dying to self says that I don't want to be God. One of the greatest challenges of our lives as we live this life is the fact that we want to be in control. That I want my dreams, I want my aspirations, I want this, I want this, I want everything in control. We want to put ourselves first. But when it comes to denying self, as Jesus is denying himself in this passage of scripture, that means that God is first in my life. And those decisions are not my own anymore, but they are his. But 
When you deny self, you say God is first and his people are before me. And I'm going to deny myself for their sakes. Just as Jesus is denying himself for ours. If, if anybody had any time learning about church history, a lot of times you would come across a man by the name of John Calvin. He had been called to Geneva by another individual, by William Farrell. And after three years of being at the church in Geneva, so many people were opposed to his reforms in the church that they literally ran him out of town. John Calvin was a Frenchman in a Swiss city, and so that was strike one against him. His reforms were unpopular. Many people were so discouraged and so upset with John Calvin, they would name their animals John Calvin so they could kick their animals. They named their children obscene names so that the ministers would have to say these obscene names when they were baptizing them in the churches. And these people did all of these things to John Calvin to run him out of town. When he left Geneva, he went to a city called Strasbourg, and he ministered to a congregation of French Protestants in exile. And if you read anything about John Calvin, these were the happiest years of his life. He loved it. He loved ministering to these exiles from France. He was able to study. He was able to write. They accepted him. He was taken care of. He found himself a wife. Things were going wonderfully. And then he gets something in the mail that says, Calvin, we beg you, come back. And it was from Geneva. And Calvin says in a letter to one of his friends that that was one of the last things he wanted to do. Why go back to a group of people that ran me out of town? Why go back to a group of people that would name their animals after me so they, they would kick them? Why go back to a city that would name their children obscene names so that I would save them as a minister? Why would I go back to be miserable? I'm happy. But he said in his letter to one of his friends, I am not my own. I belong to God. I must live for him and die for him. And if he's calling me back to Geneva, then there I must go. Jesus, in this passage of scripture, is a living example of obedience to God the Father. Before creation, before sin entered, entered into the world, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit had a plan to save humanity. And Jesus was just weeks, maybe months away from fulfilling that. And in the midst of all that, he tenderly tells the disciples that this is what's going to happen so that they would know and that they would understand. In, in verses 18 through 19, Christ gives us the, the details of what is about to happen. He is the ultimate last shall be first. Jesus is going to warn the disciples that they're going to be spiritual betrayal by the Israelites, religious leaders. Their leaders are going to betray Christ, and the disciples need to come to grips with that. Remember, it was just a few chapters ago that the disciples were upset with Jesus because they offended the Pharisees. And Jesus is reminding him in verses 17 through 19 that they are going to betray me and give me over to the Gentiles. We look at verses 16 through chapter 16, verse 22, 21, where we see the first time that he mentions that he's going to die. He says there, 16, 21, from that time forth began to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. If you were to look Matthew 17, verses 22 through 23, again he says, 
And while they abode in Galilee, Jesus said unto them, The Son of Man shall be betrayed into the hands of men, and they shall kill him, and the third day he shall be raised again. And they were exceeding sorry. You come to verses 18 and 19 of chapter 20, and you see two new details that Jesus is given to the disciples. First, the court, the high court, the Sanhedrin is going to condemn Jesus and turn him over to the Roman authorities. You see there in verse 18, And the Son of Man shall be betrayed unto the chief priests and unto the scribes, and they shall condemn him to death, understanding that he's going to go through a trial. And when they condemn Jesus, they're going to deliver him up to the Gentiles to mock, to scourge, and to crucify him. The Jews couldn't administer this death sentence, so they had to turn Jesus over to the Romans so that the Romans could do the crucifixion. Jesus is telling his disciples, we're supposed to be going to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover, but really what's going to happen is I'm going to go through this trial, be condemned by the high priest, and be crucified on a cross. As one commentator says, the disciples knew they were going to the capital for the Passover, but they could not know the struggle it had caused him. That Jesus was going to the capital not to simply celebrate the Passover. He was going to die on behalf of his people. Jesus is telling him the concern for his disciples, telling him the truth, telling him about what's going to happen. But in so doing, he's revealing to the disciples his deity, that he is God. How does anyone know that Jesus is going to do all of these things unless he knows that he is from God? This is God's plan. This is how it's always been. Now, we're, we're so enamored, right, with the idea that we want to know the future. But could you imagine knowing your future is that you're going to die on a cross? To live your entire life knowing that you're going to be beaten, that you're going to be punched, that you're going to be flogged, that you're going to be lied about, that you're going to be betrayed, that you're going to hang on a cross naked. And that's how you're going to end this life. And if you were told that when you were a young child, what kind of trauma that must have been to a young child, and then go and live life. Don't worry about it, that's how you're going to die. And we get some glimpses of this in our own life when we find out that certain people may have cancer and they only have a certain amount of time to live. And they know that this is how they're going to die. But to live your entire life knowing that this is how you're going to die, ashamed and betrayed by the, by the very people that you came to die for. And J.C. Miles says of this passage of scripture, he saw Calvary from a distance all his life. And he chose it for his disciples, and he's reminding of them it here. Can you imagine the pain and the anguish Jesus walked this earth knowing how he was going to die? And dying for a people that didn't want him. Dying for a people that could care less. Dying for a people that, in respect, has committed cosmic treason against the King of kings and Lord of lords. And as you go further in the verses, not only does he be condemned by the Sanhedrin, he's going to be given over to the Roman authorities. I mean, think about it. For those of us who have grown up in church or have spent any time in church, we've often just, just assumed that Jesus is going to die the death of a crucifixion. 
And sometimes it just under knowing that we become so familiar with it that it doesn't even phase us anymore. Do you realize that this is the first time in the book of Matthew that Jesus tells his disciples this is how he's going to die? He calls them in chapter 4. He tells them to take up your cross and follow me on multiple occasions. And to the disciples, that is a, a terrible metaphor and a terrible analogy. Why would I want to carry a cross that's condemned for a criminal? And yet Jesus is the first time in the whole book of Matthew that Jesus tells his disciples that he's going to die by death of a crucifixion. And what a shocking illustration it must be for discipleship to take up your cross and follow me not knowing that Jesus is going to die on a cross. If you want true discipleship, Jesus says, if you want to be followers of me, if you want to be my disciples, then take up your cross and follow me. And we finally realize now in Matthew chapter 20, verses 17 through 19, the disciples finally understood something. That Jesus is going to die on the cross for them. We cannot appreciate the cross enough. I mean, we can't appreciate the cross unless we understand how scandalous this was going to be for Jesus Christ. We I mean, think about the parable of the landowner. We tell God that that's not fair. The hired servants that were hired the first hour tells the landowner that that's not fair. And God showing his graciousness and justice in verses 17 through 20 shows us that his son is now committed to die on the cross for our sins. And how dare we say that God's not fair? If you go to Mark, Mark tells us that the disciples were amazed and they fell down with fear. Luke says they were absolutely bewildered by what Jesus has just mentioned to them. And yet, and it seems that it's almost like blasé fair verses chapter 16 and chapter 17. They were startled with the news. They're startled again in chapter 20. And they do not realize at the very end of verse 20, he says, in the third day he shall rise again. Every time he predicts his death, he reminds the disciples that there's going to be glory on the other side. Every time that he says that I'm going to die this way, I will raise again. But if you think about his resurrection, it, it tells us at least three things this morning in this passage of Scripture. It testifies again to that Jesus is God. How does he know that he's going to die and then raise again? Unless he's God. It also says that he's the righteous lamb to take away the sins of the world. Jesus wasn't a sinner, and yet he died. And the question goes, then, why do we die? And the Bible tells us because we're sinners. So why does Jesus die if he's not a sinner, but we die and we are sinners? Jesus died because he stepped into the sinner's place to take your place, to take my place. 
And Jesus died not because he was a sinner, but he took the sinner's place. But the great thing about Jesus' resurrection is it is necessary for our salvation. The resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is absolutely essential for our salvation. For his resurrection is now allowing us to walk in newness of life. That phrase we use after we baptize someone. Now walk in newness of life. I'm reminded again of the good news of the gospel. I'm reminded again of what Jesus is going to do for the disciples, what he has done for us. And reminded continually, three times in Matthew, what Jesus is going to do for the disciples. And we understand as Christians that Christ's death is at the very center of Christianity. Throughout his death and resurrection, there would be no Christianity. Now, Francis Schaeffer, the great Christian apologist of the 20th century, had a famous saying. He would ask a question. He says, if Jesus is the answer, then what is the question? If Jesus is the answer, then what is the question? See, you, a lot, oftentimes we know the answer to the question. Jesus is the answer. But a lot of people don't understand what the question is. Jesus had to die. We can't appreciate the gospel, we can't appreciate the good news of Jesus Christ until we understand that we are sinful, wretched creatures that have no business coming into the presence of the throne room of God. And yet Jesus makes it possible that we can. Jesus makes it possible that we can have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And then we can experience the depths of God's love for our souls. Then we can understand that it is what it means to the last will be first and the first will be last. Again, we ask the question, is God fair? By Sunday evening. And God's not fair, but he's just. Because what's fair is that God would condemn every single one of us to a die in devil's hell. That's fair. Not to send his son to die on the cross for our sins. Not to send his son to be beaten and scourged and flawed. To have some monkey trial to be sent before the Roman authorities so that he could be crucified. Naked, hanging on a tree. But God in his abundant mercy and grace and his abundance of goodness for your soul and mine sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. May the Lord bless us with a real understanding of the meaning of Jesus' death on the cross this morning. Let us pray. Father, we ask you that this morning as we think about your word. And Father, how we stand before you unworthy. How we stand before you mar marveling at the fact that your grace has poured out been poured out upon our souls. Father, if there is one here this morning that has not tasted has not understood what it means to know the depths of your love. May that person know it this morning before it's too late. Help them to understand that Jesus died for their sins. 
Father, help us not to be apathetic to that. Help us to realize what that really means in our own lives this morning. That you are a good and gracious God. These things we ask in your Son's name. Amen. Let us stand and sing for our final hymn this morning. What wondrous love is this? What wondrous love is this? Jesus has died on the cross. Dennis, would you close us in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word. We especially thank you for God and his precious son who died on the cross for us. He didn't have to do it, but he stepped down willingly and took upon his life all our sins, past, present, and future, and he did it for us. And again, he didn't have to do it, but he volunteered to do it. How grateful, how such love can be poured out for us who are sinners at the time, and yet he did what he did for us, knowing that if we accept him as our Lord and Savior, that we would have eternal life through him and forgiveness of sin through Jesus Christ. We ask 